This program is brought to you by the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors, promoting political advocacy, education, and the ethical conduct of its members nationwide. So many advisors ask me, Anne, why should I spend my time, leave my busy practice, and focus on the different generations? And I say to them, there are two reasons. Reason number one, maintaining your assets, your AUM. And reason number two, diversifying your book and getting new clients. Let's look at number one. Two major wirehouse firms on Wall Street conducted independent studies to find out what is the percentage of assets that are retained when a client dies. And independently, they came up with the same answer. Only 2%, only 2% of assets are retained when a client dies. Two percent. That means that 98 percent of assets for these two major wirehouses, and I'm guessing for majority of the industry, are lost to the competition. Every client dies. Why is that? I'll tell you why. Because the advisor did not take the time to get to know the children and the grandchildren of the client. And as a result, when the client actually died, the children and the grandchildren took the assets to a different competition. And if that wasn't scary enough, advisors say to me, OK, well, what's reason number two? Well, reason number two is to increase your new clients, increase your net new. What do I mean by that? Average advisor in the Wall Street industry only gets 10% new clients every year. I was shocked when I heard this. I said, how can this be? You're losing 98% of your assets every time a client dies, and you're only getting 10% new clients? How can that be? How do you run a business like that? But you know the surprising answer? Other people were not surprised. I talk to advisors all the time, almost every day. No one else was surprised. Yeah, that probably sounds about right. I talked to one advisor in Philadelphia. He said to me, you know what? That just happened to me. I said, what do you mean that just happened to you? He said, what happened was, I had a client. We kind of grew our businesses up together. He was a doctor. I was an FA. We were both very successful. And what we did is we got to know each other very well. And I'll admit, I didn't spend much time with the children and the spouse. But what did it matter? He was only in his 40s. And then he died unexpectedly. I went to the funeral. I paid my respects. And then I got a phone call about two weeks later that told me that the spouse had moved the account over the competition, and I was shocked. He says, so you know what, Ann? Your stats don't surprise me. I hear it from CSAs, from the people who are actually making sure that the client is taken care of. And one CSA complained to me just last week and said, I am so tired of doing ACATs out. I am so tired of doing the paperwork. I got in this business because I want to make sure that people can retire they want to retire, that they can fulfill their dreams. And all I do now is ACAT outs because we are not taking care of our clients and the children and the grandchildren. So if you want to make sure to maintain your AUM and increase your net new, it's time to start paying attention to the different generations, to the younger generations and to the current generations. Because let me give you some stats. Stat number one, average FA is 49 years old. Stat number two. 75% of FAs are over 49. Stat number three, average millionaire is 62. And finally, stat number four, average age of a millionaire who has five plus million in assets is 74. So what does that mean? That means in about a 10 year span, we are going to be seeing a lot of assets being transferred out. And it's up to you if you're going to maintain these assets and if you're going to keep the assets or if you're going to be part of that 98 percent that lets it go. And today I'm going to help you figure out how to maintain it as well as increase your net new so that when those generations retire and pass on you already have a pipeline of new generations that you can then grow and develop into your new clients. We're going to do three different things today. I'm going to give you the basic demographics and the landscape so you understand what is going on with our demographics of U.S. society right now. Then we're going to talk about the three main generations in detail. And then finally after that, I'm going to give you a checklist. And we're going to go through that checklist to help you maintain your AUM and increase your net new. 
So let's look at the demographics first. What you see right here is a pie chart. This is a pie chart of who is currently working in American society. This is not US population yet. This is who is working in American society. So let me explain what this means to you. For the first time ever, we have four generations working side by side. It's never happened before. Those four generations have different names. First one is known as the silent generation, dubbed by Tom Brokaw, also known as the traditionalists. They were born between 1929 and 1945. After that, we had the baby boomers. Baby boomers are just known as boomers. They're the biggest generation there ever was. They're still the biggest generation. They have no other name. After that, we have Generation X. Generation X is born between 1965 and 1980. They have a few other names. They're known as Generation X mostly. Sometimes they're called XS. We'll get into that in a little bit. And sometimes they're called the Me Generation. And then finally, you have Generation Y. They have a lot of different names. Can be known as the Millennials. Sometimes they're called the Net Generation, and ET as an in Internet. Sometimes they're called the Wired Generation. They're born between 1981 and 2001. So what you see here is who is actually in the workforce. Now, let me give you another statistic. 43% of our workforce will be retiring in the next 15 years. Let me say that again. 43% of our workforce will be retiring in the next 15 years. I didn't do a predictive model here, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out how this pie chart is going to change in the next 15 years. It's going to look very different, and your clients are going to look very different as a result. We're going to say goodbye to our traditionalists. Thank you for your service. Go enjoy your time. The boomers is going to go about half. The X is going to stay the same. They're all in the workforce. But the Ys, the millennials, they're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Because think about it. They're born between 81 and 2001. So what does that mean? The oldest Y is only 30 right now. The youngest is 10. They're not even all in the workforce yet. So as you think about your business plan and you think about where you're going in the next 5 to 10 years, think about the demographic tsunami that is coming your way and is coming the way of our entire society. Because if we don't start to understand the younger generations and start to adjust how we are working with the generations, we will all be ignoring the generational differences at our peril. Let me give you a few more statistics here. What we're going to look at today is we're just looking at what I call the big three, boomers, X, and Y. No offense to traditionalists. I have nothing against traditionalists, but most of us know how to work with traditionalists. They have been in power for a long time. Today, we're going to look at the big three boomers X and Y because I want to help you figure out how do I maintain the boomers before they start passing on and how do I get new clients from X and Y. So that's what we're going to focus on today. What you see next here are some actual demographics. This actually tells you population in the US, not who's in the workforce but the population. So again, you can see Gen Y is just a hair shorter than boomers. You can also see why boomers and Ys are sometimes called the bookend generation, because they bookend around Generation X. X is the most different generation of all of them, and we'll get into that in a little bit. The two that are the most similar are Ys and boomers. It's just their approach that's a little different. But in terms of population, you can see how do they actually make up where we're going. Let's go on now, because I want to talk about something here that research is showing. Because people say to me all the time, all right, Anne, I get it. Four different generations in the workforce. I have to get to know the younger generations. So what? Well, here's the so what. The so what is that research has shown that every generation has their own personality, has their own language, has their own way of doing business, and has their own behaviors. Yet we all tend to wear our own generational glasses. I'm a Gen X. I think like an X. I talk like an X. I act like an X. That's how I am. I'm wired based on events that happened during my formative years. What I want you to do right now in your room is just do a show of hands. Who in your room are boomers? If you're born between 46 and 64, go ahead and raise your hand. Take a look around the room. Okay, X's. Who are the X's in the room? Born between 65 and 80. Go ahead, raise your hand. And who are the Ys? Okay, Ys born between 81 and 2001. 
Yeah, so you can see there's a mix, probably slanted heavily toward the boomer right now, knowing what our average age of our FA is. However, you can also see that there may be a lack of diversity on your team, and that's something to look at. Because again, the research is showing because every generation has its own personality, its own way of doing business, it also has different strengths that it can bring you to your team. That's something we won't have time to get into today, but it's something for you to start thinking about in terms of your team. Today, we're going to focus on what does that mean with your clients. So what is the research showing? It's saying that during your formative years, so think high school, college, every generation, which is between 15 to 20 years, is what we call a cohort, every generation had political, technological, and social events that shaped their psyche. So again, let's do a quick show of hands. Who are boomers? Okay, who the boomers remembers where you were when JFK was shot? Okay, Martin Luther King. Now, you could be strangers on the street, but now you have something in common. And Xers, who remembers when Berlin Wall fell? Challenger explosion. Again, these are events that happened during a cohort span that shaped them. And then finally, Gen Y, 9-11. It's probably one of the biggest influencers of this generation. Does it mean that 9-11 did not influence all of us? Absolutely not. But what the research is showing is that certain events happen during our formative years, teens, early 20s, while you're already trying to form an identity. And what that means is that when you're forming an identity and you get these messages from social, political, and technological events, it starts to inform you of how you want to behave what society should look like, and what language you should be using. So I could go through this right now and tell you what I know based on all the work that I've done with advisors, but instead, I'm going to take you through a walk of history. What you're going to see now is you're going to see a number of slides coming at you very quickly. We're going to start with boomers, then X, then Y. Some of them you might recognize, some of them you might not recognize. And they're going to go through political, technological, and social events. I'm going to tell you what the message is from these events, because it's not so much, oh yeah, Berlin Wall fell. It's what is the message that teenagers and 20-year-olds got from that event, and therefore, how does it form their psyche? And then after that, we're going to figure out, now that you know their psyche, how do you work with them as clients? So you're going to see a number of slides go through quickly. You're going to hear me speak. My words won't match the slides, so don't try to put two and two together. Just let the slides wash over you, and we will focus on what's going on, and then I will do a summary at the end if you're a note taker. So let's start with our boomers. Okay, again, boomers are born between 1946 and 1964. So think 50s, mid-50s, early 60s. What's going on with this generation politically, socially, and technology-wise that shaped them? Let me tell you, if you weren't born a boomer, it was a crazy time. It was tumultuous. It was chaotic. What was going on? Martin Luther King assassination, JFK assassination, Bobby Kennedy assassination, Vietnam, civil rights. The country was torn apart. What did this generation do? They came together. It's the biggest generation that ever happened. They came together and they said, we shall overcome. Sounds trite to different generations now. However, that is one of the backbones of the boomer generation. It's a we generation. It's a team generation, it's a consensus generation, and they will overcome whatever it takes. What else was going on technology-wise? Man on the moon. This is probably the biggest influence of baby boomers. All of a sudden, superpower can do anything. This is an exciting time, and this generation is the most optimistic generation that we have. They truly believe they can do anything for the greater good. What was going on socially? You have Woodstock, drugs, sex, rock and roll. Absolutely. But what's the message under that? The message under that is freedom, creativity, independence. That is what defines a baby boomer. Later on, you get into the 60s and the British Revolution coming in. All of that is, again, reinforcing the message of freedom, creativity, and independence. So think about the clients you know who are boomers. Think about the people that you know who are boomers, and see if this starts to resonate. If you're a note taker, now's a great time to take a note. If you're not, just go ahead and listen in. 
I'm going to give you a summary now of what to expect if your client is a boomer. Because if you're not a boomer, you're going to be dealing with them very differently than if you were a boomer. When you think about this generation, a few key things to think about. Optimistic. We. Team. Consensus. They are the only generation that can do macro and micro. They want to see the big picture, and they want the details. This is the generation that saw that they had to make changes to the laws on Capitol Hill. They had to change Vietnam. They had to change women's rights. And then all of a sudden, they realized, oh my gosh, like women aren't going to law school. First woman to go to Stanford Law School in 1971. Okay, so they realized, here's the big picture, and oh, we need to get into law school to take care of it. So that's the only generation who needs the macro and micro. So what does that mean when you're talking with them? What it means is you're going to be using words such as we and team. So it would be like, together, we can take your assets and do the best of them for the greater good. Together, we are going to make a difference in your community, whatever their community may look like. Let's move on to Gen X, and then we'll get into more detail. So Gen X is born between 65 and 80. So again, think about their formative years. Think about what was going on in the 70s, early 80s that shaped this generation as a cohort. Politically, it was a crazy time. Okay, we go from, depending on your political beliefs, Camelot in the White House to a crook in the White House. We have Watergate, we have Jimmy Carter, we have the Iran hostage crisis, we have gas lines. All of a sudden, the government isn't quite what it used to be. And again, there's no right or wrong, good or bad. This isn't about politics, but it's understanding if you're growing up during this era, what's shaping you? When you think about what else is going on with technology, we go from man on the moon, we can do anything, to challenger explosion. What else is going on? All of a sudden, we have the dot-com boom and bust. There's a lot of money to be made out there. And there's a lot of people who want to make the money. We have the beginning of technology as we know it today. The beginning of the desktop computers. Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. All of a sudden, there's a lot of possibility that wasn't there before. This generation is also the generation of divorce. Divorce never happened or rarely happened during the boomer times. All of a sudden, the terms latchkey kid, before school daycare, after school daycare, never existed. So all of a sudden, this child is forced to figure out, now I have to get myself home from school, I have to let myself in, I have to do my homework, I have to shuttle back and forth over weekends. It's a very different time for this generation. Again, not good or bad, right or wrong, but when you think about it, you can start to understand how they were formed. What was going on as well socially, all of a sudden you have the internet, you have MTV, you see Material Girl, there's a lot of excitement about what is possible out there, and there's a lot of money to be made out there. So what is this generation saying? Well, you know what? I want some of that. I want some of that celebrity. It's the beginning of what we know as a celebrity time. And people are identifying with it, and they want more and more of it. So if you're going to describe a Gen X, there's a couple of terms you're going to want to use here. Gen Xs can be seen, and I'm a Gen X, so I can say this about myself can be seen as cynical, can be seen as distrustful, but it kind of makes sense, right? Because it's like, wait a minute, can't trust the government to take care of me because all of a sudden we're dealing with the Iran hostage crisis, we're dealing with all kinds of things we never had to deal with before. Can't really trust my family to take care of me, so you know what? I'm going to take care of me. That's why they're known as the me generation. Because I have to. Because I'm not sure anybody else is looking after me. So I'm going to take care of me. This is the generation, this is socioeconomic to a certain degree, has the highest number of MBAs. This generation is also the highest buyer of lottery tickets. Okay, they will take risk, and they want to get the rewards. This generation is very pragmatic. They are very realistic. They are very data-driven. Show me the money. You guys remember that movie, Tom Cruise? Show me the money. You know that term, W-I-I-F-M, it's a marketing term, what's in it for me? It's a Gen X term. What's in it for me? If you want me to work with you as my advisor, what's in it for me? Show me what I'm going to get out of it. Show me the benefits. This is also known as the I generation. This is not a we generation. This is an I generation. So when you're talking to them, you're not going to be saying things like, oh, together we can do this or that. They're like, no, no, together you will be seen as a leader. 
This generation likes their creature comforts. This generation likes to be seen with the latest fads. That's why they're also known as the materialistic generation. So you're going to be giving them messages that relate to that. It's going to be such as, you will move forward if you invest in this portfolio. Or you will benefit and be seen as the industry leader if we do that. It's all about them. And the language you use is you instead of we. Let's go on to Gen Y, and then we'll put it all together. Gen Y, born between 81 and 2001. So again, you're thinking, what was going on politically, socially, and technology-wise that shaped this generation in the early 90s? Politically, no-brainer, 9-11. Research has shown that this generation, because at this time everything was being streamed, literally has 9-11 seared into their brain. JFK assassination, we saw it in a newspaper, maybe on TV at the ABC News. 9-11, they saw it again and again and again. And if there is one message from this event that has shaped this generation, it is connections. This generation is all about connections. People say to me all the time, what is it? Like, why do they have to have 5,000 friends on Facebook? I'm like, because they are connecting. They connect on a global scale. Boomers connect on a much more intimate level. But it's about connecting to the world, connecting to a cause. What's going on with this generation technology-wise? Everything is available. It's instant downloaded. People say to me all the time, why do they expect everything now? What do you expect? I mean, they can download any information they want at any time. They were born with a mouse in their hand. Why wouldn't they be able to want everything now? So when you think about this generation, there's a little bit of a different twist here. This generation is all about connections. We're back to we. We're back to teams. This generation grew up on teams, sports, that type of thing. This generation is about as politically, socially, environmentally correct as you can be. This generation is as diverse as you can be. They see no color. And if you do, and if you inadvertently say something, you will offend this generation big time. Boomer FAs don't always realize that. And yet it's something to really keep in mind. This generation is used to having a say in things. They had family meetings at the age of five. You know, it's like, OK, where do you want to go for vacation? You know, exes had to go on two vacations, because one was his mom and one was his dad. Boomers didn't even get to go on vacations. And wise had a say from the age of five. So they expect to be listened to. And this generation really wants to make a difference. People say to me all the time, how do I motivate a Gen Y? And I say, how do you motivate a Gen Y? Give them an experience. It's all about experience for them. Gen X, gross stereotype. It's about the money. It's about the prestige. It's about materialism. Gen Y, it's about the experience. If they can have an opportunity to work with someone who's a leader or to do something different, that's what they want. This generation is the highest educated generation. 73% of this generation expects a second degree. Not wants, not saving toward. They expect a second degree. So you and your branch need to think about, how can I help them get that? I know I've gone through this quickly. And I wanted to give you the basics of understanding who are the generations, because these are your clients. The boomers are probably your clients now, as well as traditionalists. Xers are coming up. Ys you may not be paying too much attention to. However, don't forget who's running Facebook, who's running Google, and who's running a lot of the other internet. So it's time to start paying attention to them as well. So now that you understand who the generations are, what makes them the same, what makes them different, how to speak with them, how to work with them, you may be wondering, now what, Anne? Like, this is great. I can play Trivial Pursuit, or I can do Jeopardy. But what do I actually do with this information to improve my business? How do I take this information to actually maintain my assets? And the real question is, how do I actually meet the successor? I have the clients. How do I actually meet the successor? And once I even meet them, how do I even have a conversation about our assets? I admit, it's a difficult conversation. I know I'm making it sound really easy. And I know from experience working with FAs, it's not always easy. However, it is very doable. The questions that people ask me all the time are, 
how do I get the conversation going? How do I even know who to talk to? How do I even get a client to agree to have me meet their child? How do I get the client, if it's a younger generation, to meet the parents? And how do I put it all together? And I know it's not easy, because I'll tell you, there are a lot of parents who don't want the kids to know how much they're worth, even if it's not that much, because they want the kids to do it on their own. And there's a lot of kids who don't want their parents to know how much they're worth, because they don't want to look like they're up showing the old man. I know there's a lot of companies that are family-owned companies, and it's your job to start talking to them about a succession plan. But they don't even want to start talking about a succession plan. And if it's a family-owned business, they really don't want to be talking about that. And who's going to be the heir apparent if there's a daughter and a son together in the company? This is a difficult conversation. I get that. And I get how difficult it can seem to you right now. So I'm going to give you a checklist to help you have these conversations. Whether the conversation is going from down to up or up to down. And what I mean about that is, right now I primarily am talking about the client being a boomer or traditionalist, maintaining the assets through the generation to the children and the grandchildren. However, I have seen a number of very successful FAs do it the other way, where because of their generational knowledge, they already had the Gen X or the Gen Y client who was doing quite well, and then asked to meet the parents, and then grab the parents as a client as well. Because the parents would say, well, Johnny's just going to inherit it anyway, so why don't you just take my account and work with it together? So whether you're working with the younger generations and moving up, or whether you're working with the older generations and working down, the five-step checklist will help you. It's five steps to making sure that you are doing the best you can to maintaining your assets. Five easy, simple steps. I've worked with FAs on this checklist over nine months to 12 months now. And I have had very good success rate with the FAs as well as advisors who are using this step by step. Step number one, practice the language. I know it sounds crazy. It's like, oh, come on, Ann. Like, I, I can talk Gen Y. I'm like, no, it's not saying dude, OK? Dude is not going to help you get an account, OK? There are certain things that you need to do to practice it. Step two is you want to figure out who is the successor. It's very important if you have a client to maintain the assets through the generation, who is the successor going to be and to start preparing for that. And then finally, the final step is understanding, how do I have a meeting with everybody in the room? How do I have a meeting with a client who may be traditionalist or boomer, with a child who may be boomer or X, depending on the age group, and with a grandchild who may be a Y? And how do I have a conversation with all of them so that they all agree that the assets are staying with me. And that's what we're going to get at the end of this presentation. So let's look at step number one here, OK? Practicing the language. I know. People don't like role plays. I get it, OK? And here's the stats. The stats are showing that if people actually practice their language, they have a better chance of being successful. We're all smart. We're all educated. We all can say, oh, yeah, I know how to say that in my head. But when you actually try to speak Gen X or try to speak Gen Y, I've had a number of FAs and advisors say to me, I just can't get the words out of my mouth. I don't know how to have a conversation like this. So we're going to do a little role play right now. So here's what I want you to do. On your screen, you will see what I call my cheat sheet, which is available after this presentation. At the bottom of my cheat sheet, you'll see some words. Under each of the generations, I've written the words that work, the words that work for boomers, for X, and for Y. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to do a few things. Step number one, go into your group and pair up with someone. And if there's an odd number, make it a trio, but try to do pairs. One of you is going to be an advisor. One of you is going to be the client. A is the advisor. B is the client. A, you're going to be advising the client about something a new portfolio, sustainable portfolio, whatever the case may be. B, you're going to be the client. Before you do this, A, I want you to tell B the generation you can least relate to. 
So it might be, I'm an X, so if it was me and I was working with my partner, I'd say, I'm Ann, I'm Gen X. The generation I can least relate to is traditionalists. So then I turn to my partner, B, B, you're going to pretend to be a traditionalist. So you, get, you look at the cheat sheet, you use traditionalist words, you think about what a traditionalist would be asking about this portfolio, about this investment. A, you're going to be trying to use that language to sell them. Go ahead and give it a try. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Go ahead and give it a try. All right, welcome back. So how was that? I can't necessarily hear your comments, but I'll tell you what people have told me when we've done this in the past. People have said it's awkward. People have said it feels forced. People says, have said it feels manipulative. Okay. I can understand all that. It is awkward to learn a new language. And yet if you're going to France, you want to know how to get a cup of coffee. And if you're speaking to a Gen Y, you want to know how to get them to relate to you. Are you going to close the sale doing this? Absolutely not. However, are they going to start to perhaps relate with you better? Are they going to start to understand you better? You have a better chance. So now we're going to switch, and then we're going to do it again. So now Bs, you're the advisor. As, you're the client. Bs, think about the generation you can least relate to. Tell the A. A, pretending to be that person. And go ahead and talk about what you would normally do in your meeting with a client, however, using the correct generational language. Again, you'll see this screen up here with the words that work, and you have 30 seconds. Go ahead and go. Welcome back. I know that was awkward. I get it. It was awkward for me when I started out as well. And people say to me all the time, and do I really have to do this? And I say, yes. If you want to be successful working with the different generations in your practice, maintaining your assets, increasing net new clients with the Gen Y and Gen X, yes, you have to practice this. It's called the platinum rule. Who here knows the golden rule? Right? We all know the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Who here knows the platinum rule? Platinum rule is do unto others as they would do unto themselves. In other words, speak their language. If you're in France, you speak French. If you're in Russia, you speak Russian. If you're talking to a Gen Y client, you speak Gen Y. Are you going to use every word in the cheat sheet? Absolutely not. However, I do encourage you to start practicing these words, to start figuring out how to meld them into conversation so it sounds natural so that you can start to create the rapport and the bond with your client. That's step one. So step two is to figure out, well, how do I have a meeting with a different generation? So in this case, we're not talking about net new. In this case, we're talking about maintaining your assets. So we're talking about a situation where you have a client, high net worth, ultra high net worth, where you want to make sure that the assets are maintained in the family when that client passes on. So you want to start to create the relationship with the children and the grandchildren. That's what step two and the rest of the steps are all about. So people say to me, oh, great, I'll just invite them into a meeting. Eh, it's not going to work. Okay? In most cases, the child is probably 30s or 40s, probably have their own advisor, and if not, have probably already established themselves in their career, not necessarily wanting to work with the old man's FA or the old man's advisor. So you have to start to create a completely independent relationship with the child or the grandchild. 
you have to start to figure out to get to know them in a different way than you knew the client. And that's what I call a social setting. Again, I've worked with advisors doing this part for over 18 months now. And I can give you some of the best practices that advisors have done during this time. I know one advisor who rented a theater for the production of Annie. And he invited the clients and the children and the grandchildren to all see the production of Annie. It was a huge success. The clients loved it. And the advisors got a chance to meet the children and the grandchildren in a social setting. So all of a sudden, it's not just a name or who, who's your advisor again? But now they're starting to put a name to a face. Another advisor I know did a great job and went apple picking with the family. Rented a whole orchard, invited about 100 different people. And again, client, child, grandchild, they all went apple picking. They all got pictures. They all got recipes afterwards. It was a way to create a bond with the family. I know lots of advisors who are doing these types of things. So after this session, I want you to take a few minutes and brainstorm in your group and think about other ways that your group can start to create relationships that are social at first with the children and the grandchildren of your clients. Because eventually, when we get past this stage, that social piece will have helped create the bond with them. And then you can move on to the financial conversation later on. Let's go into step three right here. Step three is actually starting to prepare for the meeting. You guys are all great at discovery. You don't need me to tell you how to do discovery. You know how to ask the questions. You know how to make sure that you get everything you need so you can start to create the appropriate relationship and the appropriate information for your client. My urge here in step three is that you add the generational piece to it. So when you start thinking about this meeting, start asking yourself, who's going to be at this meeting? What is their approximate generation? Based on that, what is their approximate language that I should be using? Perhaps what are some different ways that I might want to be giving information, presenting information, having a discussion with them, depending who they are as a generation. And all of that is something for you to start adding into your usual discovery so that you can start to prepare for the meeting appropriately. Because again, the end goal we're looking here at step five is having an intergenerational financial meeting with everybody in the room. And you have to prepare for that. Let's go on to step four. Because not only are you preparing, but you're, cre you're creating the appropriate presentation. What do I mean by that? Just like every generation has its own personality, its own way of doing business, they like things a little different when it comes to presentations. Think about it. Boomers. How are they raised? How are they taught? They like words. Because of their age, they probably want bigger words, bigger fonts. They want lots of paper. They're happy to get it all. They're going to read it beforehand. That's appropriate for that generation. Gen Y, they want it now. They want it on links. They want it immediately. They don't want a lot of words, maybe one or two pictures, and then some bullet points. Give me the big picture. Gen Y is all about the big picture. Gen X, they're in the middle. Gen X is total micro. Again, remember, you've got boomers are micro and macro. Y is completely macro. Xs are very micro. They want the details. They want the stats. They want the pie charts. They want the graphs. They want all the details. You can send it in a link, or you can give it to them in paper. doesn't matter quite so much on that. Or they pr would prefer to have it electronically, at least in a PDF. So when you think about, well, how am I going to present this information? It's really important to start thinking about how are you going to change your presentation depending who's there, or use the same presentation but give it in different formats to each of the people who are going to be at that meeting. And finally, we're at step five, conducting your intergenerational financial meeting. This is where you want to go. It'll probably take you about six to eight months to get to this point where you've practiced the language, where you've made sure that you've met the heir, apparent, child, grandchild, socially two, three times, where you've prepared your notes for the meeting, where you've created the presentations, and then finally is the time to have a meeting. The client has agreed that it's appropriate to have the meeting. The children have agreed that they want to be involved in the meeting to discuss the financial future. 
this is where you want to go. So how do you do this? How do you have a meeting with a client who's of one generation, a child who has agreed to be at the meeting but may have their own advisor, and a grandchild who may or may not be even interested in being in the meeting? How do you have this meeting where everybody is engaged and everybody decides that they want to continue to work with you? I'm going to give you an example of how this can happen. On your screen, you will see here a situation that I'm setting up. It's similar to the role play. Now, at this point, I'm not going to make you do the role play. I know once is enough. I encourage you to keep practicing, but once is enough for today. So I'm going to do this right now. So I'm going to invite you to a meeting that I am holding, and I am pretending to be the advisor. And I've invited three people to my meeting. Let me introduce them to you. First of all, I've invited Tom. Tom is my client. He's a boomer. Been my client for over a decade now. We have a great relationship, a great rapport. However, I am aware he and I are both getting older. I am aware that his children are getting older, and I need to start to form that relationship. Tom is a business owner. So in this particular case, he has not brought his children. However, he has brought his colleagues with him. He has brought his CFO with him. She is a Gen X. In addition to that, he has brought his rising star with him, Justin. It's a small company. Tom wants Justin to be part of this conversation. And he has asked you to start to inform them about what's going on and what's happening with the finances. Now, at this point, I'm not going to go through the whole run through with you. But I'm going to tell you how you can frame the beginning of the meeting to make sure that you can see how you could have this conversation. Because remember, you're talking to three generations. And remember that the average attention span of Gen Y is 33 seconds. You have 33 seconds to capture the attention of Gen Y. Now, I'm going to use my words based on the cheat sheet that you saw. You know your clients best, so you're going to perhaps use different words. I don't have a script in mind, but again, because I know my words and I know that I want them to get involved and work together with me, I might say something like this. I would say, Tom, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for bringing Ashley and Justin. I know how important community is to you, and I can guarantee you that together, all of us, we will be able to work together to make the difference to the community that is so important to you. I will be giving you lots of information, some of it you already know, and we'll be repeating it further on for you. And yet what I really want you to know, that this decision that we're going to make today will leave a legacy, a legacy for your community of your organization and for your children. Ashley, I know you want the details. I've already sent them to you. They're at the office. All the charts you want there, all the data you want is there. What I want to leave you with right now is one nugget of information. And that nugget of information is that this investment will not only help Tom and the organization move ahead, but this investment will establish you as a leader moving forward in your career. And finally, Justin, I know, I know, don't pull out the iPhone yet, OK? What I want you to do is I just want you to focus on what today is about. And today is about making a difference and we need your help. We need your innovation and creativity for the greater good. And so let's work together to make that happen. Now, is that the whole meeting? No. But you can see how I framed it. I talked a little bit to each person. I used keywords. I sprinkled the ideas through. And in your situation, you will just continue to do that. And then what are you going to do as follow up? The links are already sent to Justin. So he has everything he needs. The information is already there for Ashley, whether it's a PDF or actual paper. And then finally, Tom has all the information he needs. And that's going to be a face-to-face -face follow up, because boomers prefer face-to-face -face follow up. So that's an example of how you can successfully retain your assets through the generations, whether it's a generation in terms of a family business, whether it's a generation in terms of a real family, or whether it's the generation of a non-family business. I know I've talked a lot today about the generations, about how you can improve your business. 
And so I'm going to leave you with some homework. I know, I know. No one likes homework. And I guarantee that this will help you. It's only four things. One is I want you to start practicing the language. Get the cheat sheet. I have my email coming up. I will send it to you and start practicing it. Practice it on your community, on your family, on your children, on your dog. I don't care who. Just start getting the words out of your mouth because then you can start to switch your brain between the different generations. After that, I want you to go through your book. And I want you to identify two clients who you think, hmm, either this person is high net worth or ultra high net worth, and they're getting older, so I need to start paying attention to them because I have no idea who the successor is. Or it may be someone who, again, is high net worth or very important to your business, and you just want to get to know the children better. It doesn't matter. Identify two of them, though. Start figuring out who are the clients I need to start paying attention to. After that, I want you to start setting up social meetings. Work with your client. Figure out what works with this family or company, depending what it may be. But start setting up the social meetings so that you can meet the successor, the heir apparent, socially. And then finally, I want you to actually start having that financial meeting. It will probably be six to nine months, OK? But start practicing now, preparing for the meeting, step three, preparing for the presentation, step four, and have that final meeting with all the generations together. And then let me know how it goes. Because I talk to FAs all the time who call me, who email me, who say, I had this meeting. Here's what I did. Could we do a little different? What can I do next time? I'm happy to speak with you. I'm always looking for best practices. So please feel free to contact me. In summary, I just want to remind you that there are four generations in the workforce. Yet if you want to maintain your AUM, and increase your net new. If you want to make sure that you are diversifying your portfolio, it's time to start paying attention to the younger generations, Gen X and Gen Y. Because if we don't, we'll be ignoring generational differences at our peril. I have five strategies that I use all the time with advisors to help them increase their business very quickly through the generations. And today, I'm going to share three with you. What are the three that we're going to focus on today? One is about me, one is about you, and the third one is about us. What's the one about me? Very simple. Email me. My email is right here. And I will send you my cheat sheet. I have a small version and a big version. People ask for this all the time. They put it by their phones. They put it by their computer so that when they pick up the phone and talk to a client, they can remember who the generation is and they can remember what words to use. I'll happily send that to you for free. What's number two? Number two is ask me to speak at a state convention. I do it all the time. I have major wirehouses clients. I can do that for you. And what's number three? Let me help you write a script. Let me help you figure out exactly how to script your conversations during step five, that intergenerational financial meeting. I do it all the time for advisors. We talk on the phone for about a half hour, sometimes an hour. They tell me who all the players are. We work together knowing what their objectives and their goals are, and I help them write the script. And I am more than happy to do that with you as well. I want to leave with a closing thought. This is actually from the Anklovich report, a marketing report. And what that report said is that understanding a generation's defining characteristics and core values can help businesses create products and craft messages that capture the customer's attention. And I encourage you to work with the generations as you craft your message to your clients to maintain your AUM, to increase your net new. And if you do, I guarantee that the next generation, also known as Generation Z, the oldest of who is now five, will be glad you did. Thank you. Thank you for participating in this program. For more information regarding products, programs, services, and other NAFA member benefits, visit www.nafa.org.